And now we are going to have Dr. Faye Taylor introduce our second speaker. Uh, good morning, still morning. Um, our second speaker is Reverend Dr. Erica Crawford. She is an ordained itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She's currently the pastor of Mount Zion Amy Church in Dover, Delaware. She's been a university chaplain. She's been a hospital chaplain. She's been a chaplain to the WNBA New York Liberty basketball team. Um, she is the connectional president of the AME Church Women in Ministry with over 4,000 members. Um, on a personal note, I've known Dr. Crawford uh, as a colleague and a friend, and I've witnessed her journey in ministry, and she's been in ministry over 20 years. She's a creative and inspirational leader with a tremendous gift for administration. When the pandemic shut down things for our regional church here in the Northeast, um, she was able to share her technical skills and became a member of what is now our tech team that manages all of our worship services for the region. And so I'm very happy to introduce uh, her to you today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Taylor, and thank you, New Brunswick, for uh, this great opportunity to come and share with uh, this community of faith, that which I have learned and that which uh, I have experienced. It indeed has been a journey for us, for all of us, and even those of us who are uh, who are techies and know our way around technology and are familiar with the church, this experience has uh, changed the way we envision church and the way we approach and worship. And so again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to come and share what I have learned and how I have grown uh, with the hope that it will be uh, encouraging for others. Uh, and so uh, let me just thank the Lord for the privilege uh, to share. And so for the few moments that are, are mine this morning, want to uh, expound upon, share with you uh, thoughts about uh, what's next in digital worship, uh, digital worship. Uh, this pandemic uh, has, has changed us. Um, this pandemic, this invisible enemy has seismically shifted and transformed our ministries. It has forced pastors to preach to empty pews, to smartphones, to tablets, to telephones, and to computer screens. Uh, this novel coronavirus, COVID-19, has adversely impacted our congregations in unparalleled ways. It has fundamentally shifted our understanding of worship and fellowship, and it has forced us to reevaluate our ministries and to reaffirm the importance of community. Culturally, uh, for many, and it's important that we culturally understand our congregations, uh, the church has been an opiate from the world's pain. It has been our refuge in times of distress and despair. It has been uh, the incubator of our hopes and dreams. It has been the headquarters for our marching orders. And it has been our dispatch, so, uh, dispatch center uh, for soldiers in our fight and quest for justice. So moving through, navigating through uh, this COVID quarantine season has in some ways uh, challenged us because that which has been familiar to many of our congregations uh, to many of our congregants, I know for, for me and the great congregation I serve here in Dover, Delaware, uh, my congregation is uh, predominantly uh, senior citizens, even though some of them would consider themselves to be junior senior citizens. Nonetheless, for them, uh, church and worship has always been their place of refuge. Uh, as the pastor of a, of a congregation that is predominantly African-American people of color, it has been their hiding place uh, when, when times uh, have not always been kind or fair or just. And so to go through uh, not only COVID-19, but the social and civil unrest in our communities and not have the ability to gather, not have the ability um, to assemble, uh, created in and of itself its own challenges. And so uh, recreating or cultivating an atmosphere for worship that was conducive 
and culturally sensitive to the needs of the community uh, was something that stretched me. And I think most of us can say uh, that this season has stretched us. And so the question became for, for me and for most of us who serve in pastoral or some sort of congregational leadership, uh, we're out of the building, now what? What do we do uh, when everything that is familiar is no longer accessible? Uh, and, and I would purport to you this morning um, that we have to ask a few questions of ourselves, of our congregations, of our leadership, of our ministry. Uh, how do we do what we do with closed buildings, locked doors, empty pews? Um, particularly if we come from a tradition and a culture that pulls from the energy that is gathered in those buildings, in those spaces, you know, in the, in the Black church tradition, the call and response. When now you call and there is no response. When uh, we are accustomed to looking at the faces in the pews and that kind of navigates where we go with our preaching and where, with our worship and where our music, with our music. How do we transition from the power of a gathered people, the energy that we share one with another, that we exchange to becoming an empowered, scattered people? a people who can no longer gather energy from each other in a physical space, but now in a virtual digital space, we have to find a way to exchange energy, to share energy. How do we sustain the therapeutic function of worship and fellowship amid a rapid metamorphosis? And for, for believers, uh, worship is not just uh, an opportunity for us to be in the same space, in the same place, but it is therapeutic. It is the thing that re-energizes us and refocuses us and prepares us for what comes next, right? It, it is not lost on us that, that worship uh, in most of our settings takes place on Sunday morning, takes place at the beginning of the week to send us into the week. It is what propels us into the week. It is what prepares us for what is to come. And so when that therapeutic function has changed and it has changed so rapidly that we cannot catch up, what do we do? And how do we find a way, how do we navigate the wilderness of worshiping an old God in a new way? Those are questions that I think I, I've pondered and I've asked, and I suspect um, many of you have and do as well. Uh, the short answer for, for me uh, is that we have to fully commit to serve in this present age, which means we have to be willing to embrace a myriad of unfamiliar and progressive models of ministry. And if we are coming from a traditional um, place of worship, this pushes us, this stretches us. But the church cannot afford to, to shrink back, to avoid going where the world is going. We have to, as, as leaders in the church, as members of the church, as advocates for the church, as representatives of the church, we have to be present and we have to be vital to the change of the world. Re uh, remaining the way we have been and doing what we have always done is no longer an option. We have to make the shift. We have to make the change. The reality is, is that this pandemic is every congregation's moment of reckoning. Every church, regardless of your size, regardless of your budget, this, this shift to a digital worship, to a digital platform, to a virtual campus is our moment of reckoning. This pandemic has pushed us over the threshold of radical discontinuity uh, with so much momentum that we cannot stop it and we can't waste time trying to understand it. Uh, and I believe that for many of us, we spent too much time trying to process what was happening, how long it would be happening and how we could avert it or divert it that we missed some key moments of ministry. We cannot go back and recapture them 
But what we can do is take hold of our current reality and realize that we have to move with the movement. This pandemic also became the great equalizer. Uh, it became a platform for all churches, including smaller churches that were once gasping for air, pleading for members, juggling resources. This became an opportunity for every church to move on the same level, to experience the same access to people as uh, multi-million dollar churches with major budgets have been able to do. This, this experience, this digital platform, the establishment of a virtual campus uh, with the uh, computer, with a camera, with a click of a button, propelled ministries that had once been on the backside of nowhere into places of providence and moved ministries into places where the gospel could be heard and moved ministries in, in, into uh, areas that were once underexposed. And so while this was a challenge, in many ways for a lot of our churches, it was a blessing. If we made the adjustment, if we were willing to prepare, and if we were willing to go where uh, God was pushing us, and in some cases where God was pulling us. We, we are now, uh, Living in a culture, and this this was an aha moment for me. And I, I'm not I'm not old. I'm kind of in between, I guess, um, the the old and the new. I'm 46, um, but we 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 live in a culture where people no longer say I belong to a church. We're living in a day and time where we have generations of people who now say I go to church. There is a major difference between I belong to a church and I go to a church. Because to belong means you, you, you sense that you are a stakeholder in a community and that you invest in the community and the community invests in you and there is a divine partnership. But we are dealing with generations now that say I go to a church which means I have no commitment to a congregation, which means I owe them nothing and they owe me nothing, which also means that they will easily move from your worship service to another worship service, to another worship service, to another worship service. And so we as leaders in the church must be careful, but calculated about how we move and transition our ministries and our worship services to virtual, to virtual campuses and digital experiences. Virtual campuses are no longer a luxury. They're no longer optional. And it's no longer just for progressive ministries or large congregations. Living in a day and time where people go to church means that particularly while we are experiencing this quarantine season, people are hopping from digital platform to digital platform to digital platform, looking for the thing that will satisfy their thirst. And if what we present to them is not satisfying, even though their names are on our roll or their money is in our offering plate, their hearts will be someplace else. Because remember, they go to church. They don't belong to church. And so, Websites, technology, and digital footprints are a necessity for every church and every ministry that seeks to look and live, but it doesn't come without challenges. One of the things that having a digital worship experience does is it causes us to be intentional about how we worship and what we use to engage others in worship. Remember, we're dealing with people now who at one time, if they wanted to know what happened in your worship experience, they would have to get up, get dressed, find out what the address of your church was, 
Go to your church, park the car, go inside, greet the usher, sit on the pew, and then wait for the experience to start. And because most people aren't rude, even if the experience wasn't good, they would stay to the very end. They would shake your hand at the end and tell you they enjoyed service. And then either they would come back or they would disappear into obscurity. But we now live in a day and a time where people don't even have to get out the bed. They flip on their phone, they go to Facebook, they go uh, on Zoom, they go to Roku, they go to Fire, they go to Apple, they go uh, on your church website. And you have a, but a brief moment to capture their attention. And if, they're, if it doesn't meet their needs, because it, it becomes a selfish search in a lot of ways, if it doesn't meet their needs and capture, capture their attention, they just swipe left and go on to the next thing like a dating app. So our approach to worship, our engagement in worship, and um, dare I say the lights, the camera, the action has changed worship forever. And for many, going back to the pews, parking in the lot, meeting the ushers um, is a thing of the past. They have no intention of going back in the building. And so digital worship will become their primary place of experiencing God. So, so how do we how do we embrace and balance the plethora of benefits related to the available technology with all of the adverse trade-offs in our communities of faith and congregation? Because somehow, some way, we have to strike a balance. How do we encourage, and in some cases, convince others that the trade-off, despite the obvious losses and challenges, is worth it. And particularly if you're serving in a congregation that is an older congregation, it is how do we even convince them to make the investment? Because let's be honest, for the first six months or the first year, of the pandemic and our digital streaming platforms and social engagement, people will take, you know, a bad camera. They'll, they'll take a shaky lens. They'll, they'll take um, subpar sound. But that will not be always. And people have a threshold, uh, have a tolerance level for how much they're willing to take before they move on, right? It is, it is like watching a movie. You watch it, and then if it moves too slow, you go on to the next movie. I would argue um, that we have to do four things uh, as we prepare and uh, maximize um, digital ministry, digital worship. Number one, that we become intentional about our language. Number two, that we are intentional about sustaining community. Number three, that we are intentional about the ongoing work of ministry. And last but certainly not least, that we are intentional about cultivating and creating not a worship service, but a worship experience. And so we'll, we'll explore those for um, the next few minutes that are mine. When I say we have to be intentional about our language, what I mean is we have to begin speaking to our congregations and those who belong to our community of faith in ways that help them understand. We're not just streaming. This is not just streaming service. We're not just worshiping online. We're not just studying online. We're not just fellowshipping online. We have, um, in fact, commanded we have taken hold of, we, have, we are now occupying a second campus. And so the same energy we put into our primary campus, our physical campus, the same work we put into creating worship when we are in the building, that same level of energy and work and time and thought has to go into how we worship on our virtual campus. It is a second campus. It's not online worship. It is, we are creating a worship experience at our other location. If your church had physically had two or three locations, you would work 
to create the same kind of experience or, or, or equally as fruitful experience at every location. In our, um, in our work to have digital worship, we have to invest the same energy. We cannot just jump up in front of a camera and preach. We cannot just go on YouTube and download some videos to play music. Worship should be seamless, not just in person, but even on our digital platform. People should feel like we prepared for worship. It should not feel like a Facebook Live production where we happen to see something in the community that we liked and we just turned the camera on. It should feel like we have prepared to meet a virtual audience. We have to also uh, be mindful of the fact that when we have physical congregations and physical buildings and spaces um, and, and uh, facilities to maintain, that when we uh, speak to having a virtual campus, we remind people that there is still an obligation to the physical campus. And that at some point, in some way, we intend, hopefully, to go back to that place. I know even right now, um, I, I said to my congregation, okay, everyone, I, I'm, I'm planting the seeds. We're going back into the sanctuary in some way, beginning uh, Palm Sunday, and we'll, we'll continue to integrate until we get fully back in the space um, along the way. I had to begin to speak it because it uh, out of sight, out of mind. And people begin to only look at the virtual campus and the virtual worship and fail to remember that we still have obligations, financial obligations. We still have um, uh, uh, obligations to the physical space. And if we don't keep in the people's mind that at some point we are going back, they will become all too comfortable with digital being the only way of worship. And while digital works for many, it doesn't work for everybody. And so I know that they have to be struggling because I'm struggling. So in my mind, I'm, I'm beginning to process, okay, I have to get up early on Sunday morning. I have to get dressed. I have to leave the house. I have to go into the building. I have to unlock the office. I have to begin to greet people again. It is a mental process. And so in our language, we have to begin speaking so that people understand that virtual is not forever. There will always be a virtual aspect to our congregations, but at some point we're going back to uh, our physical buildings. While we're engaging in our digital worship, we have to also be intentional about sustaining community because it is easy to lose contact with those who belong to our community of faith. So are we just streaming or are we nurturing community? While we're having digital worship, while we're on Facebook, while we're on our church website, while we're on Zoom, are we still engaging the community? Are we responding to the comments that are in um, the chat session? Are we responding to the posts that are on Facebook? Or do we just stream and, uh, and, uh, and find ourselves in our own space, disconnected from everybody else? Do we find ourselves divorced from what is happening in our communities because we can hide behind a camera and a keyboard. It's not just streaming. We are still um, supposed to engage communities. So are we streaming or are we nurturing community? We, we, we have to ask ourselves, how do we continue to give people a sense of belonging? I struggled with this because in, in the Methodist doctrine, there's no nothing in the doctrine, nothing in the discipline that speaks to us about virtual membership. And so as my church began to stream its services on a, on a, on a wider platform, I found myself asking, what do I do with these people who want to join church? Because after all, after I preach, I, I put across the bottom of the screen, if 
If you would like uh, to give your life to the Lord, uh, please text us, chat, call us. I said, you know, if you would like to become a member of this household of faith, but what do I do when somebody from California wants to join my church? How do I create opportunities for that person to come into community? Because remember, worship is about, about God and engaging God, but it's also about engaging the people of God. So how do we continue? How did we continue? How will we continue to give people a place of belonging through our digital platforms, through digital worship? For, for my community of faith, uh, we created a, a Google number so that people could call and we could answer live. Uh, we assigned people to risk every time somebody posted something in Facebook, in the chat, every time someone put something online, we assigned people to be able to respond immediately to that comment. Because had we been in the physical space, there would have been some sort of response. And people come because they are looking, they are searching for community. Uh, how do, do people join our communities? How, how can people engage in our communities? How can people who may never physically come to our churches, who live too far away to ever meet us and shake our hands, how do they become community? How do we uh, put them on the roll? How do we call them? How do we interact with them? And then how do we, how do we connect our community with each other outside of the pastor, outside of clergy? What, what do we implement so that people have the same sense of community or a similar sense of community that they had before we went out? Because worship breeds fellowship and fellowship has to, has to connect people. And so we as leaders have to find a way to connect people. So that, so that worship is not just fruitful in the moment, but it continues to bear fruit long after the service has ended online, when it's no longer streaming, when the Zoom has been signed off. And when people decide they're not going to watch your worship experience at you know, 1030 when you stream it on Sunday, but they're going to watch it Monday at eight o'clock at night. How do those Monday eight o'clock at night people connect with your community? Be even though they did not join you on Sunday morning. I, I would say uh, these things. And being intentional about the ongoing of work and ministry, uh, while we are fully present on our virtual campus, we have to ask ourselves, have we sustained a, a let's just say, physical presence that bears witness to our virtual work and ministry? If every time people ride by our church, the building is closed, if every time somebody rings the doorbell or calls the church, all they get is voicemail or no answer, how have we bared witness to the fact that there is still worship and community taking place while the building is closed? And, 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 and when we first went out, I, I would encourage pastors, you have to hang something on your building. You have to put up a, a banner. You have to put up a sign. You have to put something on the doorway that tells people the building is closed, but ministry is still happening. And have we or will we allocate or reallocate funds to sustain the physical and virtual ministries that we've created? When we go back into the building, was our virtual ministry for the season? Or is it something we will continue to do? And how are we willing to invest so that happens? The thing about technology is it is an ongoing investment. When we move to digital worship, we will continue to have to make the investment. And what I mean is the camera that you bought today, the laptop that you bought this month, a year from now, You'll have to look at making investments. And if we're honest, in many of our churches, we buy something and we expect it to last till Jesus comes back. We, we buy a soundboard and we never want to update the soundboard. Uh, we, we buy an organ and we never want to upgrade the organ. Technology doesn't work like that. Technology is an ongoing investment. 
and and that is a that is a mental shift and a financial shift that we have to get our congregations to take hold of. That just because we spent $5,000 on technology this year does not mean that we don't have to allocate another $5,000 for technology ne next year. We will have to continue to make the investment or all the gains we have made, we will lose. We have to be intentional about cultivating and creating worship. And this is where I'm gonna hang my hat. We have to remember why we worship. We worship because God commanded. We worship because it glorifies God. We worship because it helps us in our development of our relationship with God. We worship because it releases the power of God's presence. It helps us to become God-centered instead of self-centered. We worship because as leaders, it's part of our priestly responsibility. It is a sign of life. And we worship both individually and corporately. And so we have to ask ourselves as we move to digital worship, what does God want to happen in the digital worship experience? Because that has to be what drives the way we engage in digital worship. If God is looking for there to be intimacy, dependency, revelation, and illumination, then when we begin our uh, or engage in our online worship, our goal has to be not how many people streamed us. Our goal has to be not how many likes we have. Our goal has to be not how many times it has been shared. Our goal has to be not all of the graphics and the likes and the fanfare. But did we create a moment, a space, a sacred place where there was intimacy with God, where there was interdependency or dependency, where there was a, a revelation? And where there was some illumination of God's will and God's word for our lives. Or did we just have great music, great graphics? We had lights flashing and names going across the screen and it was pretty. And we spent our hour and we had all of these people scroll through our page, but we never had a genuine encounter with God. We never did anything that was transformative. It was pretty, but it wasn't transformative. It was emotional, but it was not transformative. It generated income and increase, but it was not transformative. It filled the space that we had for Sunday morning, but it was not transformative. Too many of us have, have seen the bells and whistles of many of our large churches, and we've tried to chase that euphoria instead of saying, I, I can stream to 25 people and create a genuine, intimate, dependent, revelatory, illuminated experience for them. My brothers and my sisters, we have to keep in mind why we worship. And as we are intentional about, about cultivating worship, we, I would argue that we keep in mind these core uh, concepts. That worship is a spiritual act. And so rather than it being physical or material about all the other things, did we experience the spiritual presence of God? Worship has to be defined in spiritual terms, both as an event and as an experience. So our goal becomes to create an experience that is beneficial for those who have joined us, no matter when they join the experience. Uh, the intent is always to connect the heart of God through an internal open door of an indwelling spirit. Worship is um, subjective and mystical. It can be discussed and people can share their a relative experience, but it cannot be fixed by an authoritarian manner. In other words, we cannot force worship to happen. 
Putting all these fancy graphics doesn't force worship to happen. Sending out a plethora of emails and bombarding people with Facebook reminders and shares does not make worship happen. Worship has to be authentic. And so what we have to remember as we are creating an atmosphere for worship to happen is that we don't make worship happen. God makes worship happen. And when we open our hearts and minds, when we are engaged with people who want to experience worship, that is where worship happens. And so worship can happen at the kitchen table, in the living room, in the car. Worship can happen anywhere if we have done our part to help people understand what worship is. We can create an environment that is favorable for worship, but we can't make it happen. The connection is dependent on an individual's openness and God. We have to be intentional in cultivating and creating worship, and we have to ask the guiding question. Does liturgy or digital liturgy translate the gospel for this moment in this context? I know we have all of the things our traditions have taught us, all of the things we've learned and gleaned from seminaries and mentors, all of the things that, that, that uh, we have done in our churches time and time again, year after year. But does that translate into the good news for this moment in this context? Does what we do today, will what we do tomorrow digitally, Will it speak to our present reality? Will it open up a door for people to meet the God that they need today? Will it work for this moment? Or are we taking archaic practices, habits, traditions, and rituals and trying to put the, them as a square peg into a round hole? Martin Luther said of, of contemporary um, novel worship, some have the best intentions, but others have no more than an itch to produce something novel so that they might shine before people as leading lights rather than being ordinary teachers. We are not called uh, to the bright lights, um, but to be practitioners. We are called to be willing to discern what is the gospel in this moment. God's word doesn't change, but good news changes. Good news is different based on what the need of the community is. So while we are home, what good news are we sharing with our communities? What is the gospel that needs to be heard in this moment? And how do we express it liturgically? Um, I, I, I said to my congregation, even before we went out for COVID, um, when we were having a discussion about whether or not to put monitors in the sanctuary and whether or not um, to add um, some things related to virtual worship, that when you're dealing with a generation of people who have computers, laptops, iPhones, iPads, um, digital whiteboards, and all of those things, to ask them to regress, to come back to worship is unacceptable. And so even in our engagement, um, when I first started uh, streaming, I would still put on my robe every Sunday and stream. And then I, I had to have a conversation with myself. I'm dressed in full regalia, preaching to people who are sitting home in their bunny slippers and pajamas. Can they even relate to me in this space and place? Have I, have I been so married to tradition and protocol that I no longer can connect to people's reality? So it liturgically, are we able to connect? Does the liturgical enactment or, uh, or innovation draw attention to us as leaders and liturgists or presiders and planners? Or does it, does it point people to God? When people leave the digital worship experience. Did they leave thinking about us or did they leave thinking about God? Did they leave 
haven't had an experience or do they leave feeling like they just watched the show? We have to be honest with ourselves about the evolution of worship. And for some of us who are traditional, um, it, it's going to stretch us. It has stretched us. But when we follow scripture from Genesis to Revelation, we see that there is an evolution of worship that takes place when God is present and when God speaks to communities. In the days of Moses, worship went from very little structure to very specific and very detailed structure. God specified exactly during the time of Moses, when sacrifices were to be made, how they were to be made, where they were to be made, and who was supposed to make them. Worship became much more formal under Moses. And under the law of Moses, there were holy places and holy people and holy animals and holy rituals and holy times. And God designated certain things for certain uses in worship. And the tabernacle was holy. But if we follow the word, Jesus decentralizes worship. When Jesus engages the woman in John 4, 19 and 22, the scripture says, sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one must worship is in Jerusalem. Believe me, woman, Jesus replied, a time is coming where you will worship the father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such as to worship him. And so when we, when we follow the scriptures, we follow the fact that Jesus has decentralized worship in a manner that it's not about the place or the time or the space or the physical things or the material things or the traditional rituals that we have always followed, but it becomes a heartfelt, genuine moment. And so for many of us, we are losing uh, we are losing people and we are losing our interaction. Uh, we, are, we are losing our opportunity to interact with people because all we want to do is what we have always done. We, we are stuck in a Moses worship mentality that it has to be this way on this day at this time with this attire and this has to happen. But the scripture says, that Jesus essentially says to the woman, listen, everything you know is getting ready to change. I'm not concerned about going to Jerusalem. I'm not concerned about this mountain. I'm concerned. Can you meet God in a place of spirit and in truth? And my brothers and my sisters, we are having to make the shift to understand that the days of people only meeting in the sanctuary, the days of people only worshiping on Sunday morning, the days and spaces of people following the liturgy as is outlined in your hymnal, those days are moving. And so we have to be willing to be open to what Jesus is saying. Where will we worship the Lord? And what will worship look like as our congregations and our people begin uh, to evolve? How do we get a group of people who, are, who have always had the flexibility to watch worship at any time? How do we get them back into a building at an appointed time? I have a young adult uh, in my church um, and I used to stream, uh, I, I pre-record my service and I used to make it available for people to stream at any time. And then I decided I wanted to make it available at 1030 on Sunday. So they couldn't watch it ahead of time. And one of my young adults, I asked her, you know, how things were going and had she been watching service? And she said, well, I, I was watching service when you made it available and I could watch it anytime I wanted that day. But when you moved it so that I could only start it and watch it anytime after 1030, I stopped watching. And I, I said, well, why did you stop watching it? She said, because the, the kind of life and schedule I have, I need to be able to access worship when I need it and not when you want to offer it. So I said to her, well, but you can watch it anytime 
after 1030. You can watch it on Sunday night. You can watch it on Monday. And she said, I, I know I can. She said, but by the time my day starts, I'm no longer excited about joining worship. I, I want worship to be the first thing I do in the morning. And when you control when I can watch it, that I have to make a decision about what is my priority. It was mind blowing to me because she was somebody who came to church every Sunday and I, and I hope that she comes back every Sunday, but it was an aha moment for me that said, I can no longer do this the way it works for me in my traditional Sunday morning, 1030 thinking. I have to be mindful of the fact that there are people whose schedules are different, who are your non-traditional, non-conformist people who are hungry for a word and they want to be able to access it whenever they can. And so when we begin to look at worship as not something that we control, but something that we are to make available and something that uh, we have to uh, embrace the fact that it may not look like we anticipated looking, then it's different. Um, um, she said to me, I don't watch all the doxology and the call to worship and the singing. She said, I just like to fast forward to the word because I don't want all that other stuff. So then what happens when we go back into the building? What happens when we go back into a building and people have been able to fast forward worship for a year? What do we do when we go back into a building and people have been able to pause and start and pause and start? And now we're looking for them to come back into the building and they have to sit through all the singing. They have to sit through all the talking. They have to sit through all of the announcements, the things that some of our senior members live for and the things that some of our young adults cringe. We have to find a way to marry those things in a way that still gives God glory. We have to find a way to interact in ways that acknowledge the generational differences, but are also culturally sensitive. Uh, the last thing I wanna share with us for the time that's mine, as we are intentional about cultivating and creating worship, we have to raise the question, if we are the shepherd, who, drive, who does the driving? When we, when we went out um, in Mar last March, I, I had a pull for my congregation. Pastor, we want to do communion. Pastor, we want to do communion. Pastor, when are we going to have communion? And I had to take a firm stand that was unpopular um, for my congregation because other congregations in our community were still serving communion and some of them were still worshiping. And I had to take a hard, firm stand and say, the shepherd drives the sheep and the sheep don't drive the shepherd. So as we are cultivating and creating worship, one of the things that becomes imperative for us to do is to be clear about who God has given the assignment to. And if God has given the assignment to us as the shepherd or the leader or the priest of the house, we have to be attentive to what God is saying to us and not allow the, the, um, the pull of the crowd or the congregation or, or the um the articulation or the demands of the sheep to drive where worship goes. God has divinely appointed and, a, and anointed those to lead the flock. And we have to be willing to do that. The other thing I, I wrestled with when we went out um, was as we were trying to figure out what we were gonna do about the sacraments and communion, my, my initial response to them was we're not going to receive communion, that communion was meant to be shared in community. And then the Holy Spirit quickened me and said, who defines community? And what defines community? I, I wrestled with it because I asked myself, okay, so are the sick and shut in who don't come to worship, who I take communion to, are, are they part of our community? Uh, when we go back into the building and some of our seniors can't come back, are we a community? What, what number becomes the threshold in the plumb line for what community is? Is community just being able to be in the building? Is, is community um, limited to just the people who will be able to come back and not the people who will be at home? What defines community? Because when we 
uh, discern what community means, that will be what drives how we worship. If community is everybody who is connected both digitally and virtually and those who are there uh, physically, if that is community, then we become sensitive to the whole community, the needs of the community. Digital worship forces us to look at our rituals, our tradition, and our customs. So while in the, in the African-American and in, in the black church uh, context, we are accustomed to being in the church an hour and a half, two hours, when we went uh, into a digital platform, that was no longer an option. People were clear. After an hour, they're getting ready to check out. And, e and even if they didn't say goodbye, they would swipe off. So we have to learn how to balance, even going forward when, when some of us go back into our buildings. Can we go back to the full liturgy as we knew it? Can we go back to the choir singing four or five songs? Can we go back uh, to the ushers marching up and down the aisle? Can we go back to including every part of the liturgy in the experience and now move the service back to an hour and 15, an hour and a half? Can, can, we, can we go back and do that? Because that is what we have always done. Do we go back in full regalia and robes and, 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 and investments? Do we go back when we still have people who are home watching us in bunny slippers and pajamas? How do we identify? How do we, um, how do we, uh, how do we navigate ritual, tradition, and custom? And what can be stretched and expanded? What has to be relaxed? What has to be kept? What can be changed? And what can be thrown away? You know, there, there was a time when people had nothing else to do on Sunday but worship. And now we have young people who play sports and now we have people who work and now we have other things that we compete against. So as we are cultivating and creating a fruitful worship experience, what do we say is of yesteryear? What do we hold on to? And what new things, what new opportunities do we create? I, I know as, as we get ready to go back into our worship space, I've, I've created a committee on worship that, that reflects some of the older traditional members of our church and some of our uh, young adults and, and parents who have young children, because we cannot go back and do everything we used to do. We're going to have to create some new traditions. We're going to have to create some new things. And it will upset some people. And it will uh, make some people feel warm and fuzzy. But how do we do it? How do we, how do we look at celebrating the sacraments. I had a family that asked about um, baptism. They wanted to do baptism. Fine, we can do baptism. It'll be me, the parents, um, godparents, and they could have up to 10 family members. And they've decided that because they can't have the crowd they want, they'll forego the baptism and wait until they can have the crowd they want. Which as a pastor is, 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 is troubling for me. Because has it become about the performance of the sacrament or, or, or the solemn occasion? And so what, what um, digital worship and uh, social distancing and quarantine has done, it, it, I believe it has pulled the covers back on some of the things that we thought were really about God that are really about us. And so I, I want to leave these, these three things about the look of digital worship and how we move back uh, into our sacred spaces to marry digital worship and physical worship. We will have to wrestle with, do we want centralized and formal worship, which is priestly led and congregationally disengaged, which means we, as the priests of our houses of faith, we make the decisions, we engage, we lead, and everybody else is there to watch. Or do we decentralize it in some way and still have something that is formal, where we're able to lead, but we allow the congregation to be engaged and have input in ways 
that, that connect them to worship? Or do we just decentralize and make it informal? Where it's just communally friendly and engaging and it no longer has any semblance of what it looked like before. I, I struggle because I see, I, I'm not as progressive as I think I, as I would like to be or as I thought I was. And being home for digital worship has highlighted for me that I'm not, you know, I thought I was 46 and progressive. And then when I saw people doing some things, some, some services that were decentralized and informal, um, it caused me to gasp for air. And I realized I'm probably not as progressive as I thought I was. And so when we are trying to navigate and balance a generation, a culture, a, um, a secular culture of people where everything is decentralized and informal, what stance do we take in the church that draws a line between priestly functions and congregational engagement? And how do we, as we engage in digital worship, honor who God is and what God does through us as priests and still continue to engage our congregations, particularly those who will not be in our spaces? I would say, that it's going to be a marriage that takes work. Because for people who have been home for a year, worshiping under their own vine and fig tree, doing it their own way, to retrain their mind to come into a sacred space where no, you can't drink coffee, eat popcorn, and keep your feet up on the pews to worship. For many, that will be the breaking point for them to not come back. But for others who need the discipline and the structure of being in the building, it will be a relief. My brothers and my sisters, these are the things that we have to ask ourselves. And I believe that these are the things we'll have to seek the Lord for, for what is right for our community and our place of being. I'll close with this last statement. This, this week I was watching a, a sermon and the preacher talked about um, being in the, and being at, in the place that God would have you to be, doing the thing that God would have you to do. And when I um, finished that sermon, this is what I fully embraced. That worship in my congregation, the place where God has assigned me, may not look like worship in any other space or any other place, but I have to be comfortable enough in what God is saying to me and how God is calling me to lead that I no longer feel the need to make adjustments or to assimilate to what God is doing someplace else. That if God is in the midst and I am listening for the voice of God and doing the work of God, then God will cause God's work to be fruitful, even if it doesn't look like other people's work. And so again, I say thank you for this opportunity. I hope I shared something um, that is encouraging, inspiring, empowering, and emboldening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. Thank you for your honest and forthright presentation. You made so many points, I think, that are going to help us deal with the very real grieving that will take place, not only in this moment, but in anticipation of what's to come in hybrid worship. But I think it's also important to begin planning now and questioning everything that came before. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, just to remind everyone some logistics in the webinar with Zoom. So you can send your chat messages to everyone, make sure you have that highlighted. And uh, if you're commenting or you have a problem, you can privately chat me and we can try and work it out. But please use the Q&A section for your questions so I can find them quickly and easily. And uh, we have some questions for you, Dr. Crawford. Um, the big question that came in from many people, how did you add your video into that PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> okay. What software are you using? They love it. No, it's, 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 uh, it's Zoom. So what you do is um, in your screen, in your share screen function, 
Um, there's an option that says basic, advanced, or files once you click on it. You want to click on advanced. And then it says PowerPoint as virtual background. And what you do is you click on that, you upload your PowerPoint as your virtual background, and then uh, it, it moves with you. So essentially your PowerPoint becomes your virtual. It's one of the newer features. So if you have not done a Zoom update, you need to do update your Zoom with the newest uh, uh, features. And that's one of them that you go to advance and it says, make my PowerPoint my virtual background. And that's how you do it. And then you can change your size. You can move yourself around, up, down, over, <laughs> et cetera. All right, there you go. So updating is important with Zoom, that's for sure. They <laughs> they have them coming out almost daily sometimes. You're getting a lot of shout outs from the from I think the AME churches and other places. I see. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I have a question about stewardship. How does the digital impact church finances? Um uh, that, that's that's major. Uh I, I think more importantly than how it is teaching people the importance of stewardship. Uh, I am an advocate that you have to teach people um, that giving is a part of worship. It's not optional. It's a part of worship. Uh, for, for my church, uh, I pushed my church into digital giving before COVID hit. The impact uh, uh, has been for those who are accustomed to writing checks, um, that it was an adjustment for them to have to mail in their, their money. When I, I do digital worship, one of the things I scroll across the bottom of the screen is how to give. Uh, and because uh, people don't watch the whole service digitally, you one of the things you have to do is find a way to mention it, scroll it across the bottom of your screen throughout the service. Because some people, as I said, are fast forwarding straight to the sermon. So if you're waiting for that one moment of the offering time for them to give, they're not going to do it. So, so that's one of the things that I do is I scroll across the bottom of the screen throughout the worship experience. This is how you can give. You also have to make it available on your website. You have to... Um, uh, make it available on your Facebook page. For me and my congregation, they have multiple ways to give. They can give by text message. They can give by cash app. They can give by mailing it to the church. They can give by going on the church website. Uh, I have found that you have to give people multiple opportunities to give because the first time they want to give and can't give, they won't go back and give. Uh, so I would say uh, that, 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 and Talk to, talk to your young adults about the best way to give. We get tithes and offers all week long. Sometimes in a Thursday night at midnight, somebody gives. So you have to make sure that people have a, a way to give. But I think most importantly, it is teaching people the importance of giving so that they understand. Remember I said earlier about uh, language, that they can't think that because I'm not at the building, the lights, the, the utility bill doesn't have to be paid and the insurance doesn't have to be paid. We have to teach stewardship that we are still responsible for our physical plants and the building and its salaries. And part of our giving is a response to God's word. It, giving is an act of worship and obedience. And it is teaching people, not just when you need the money, it is teaching people all year long, um, and I'll just say this, my church, I don't allow my church to do any fundraisers. I don't allow my church to do any special fundraising afternoon services, no fish dinners, no bake sales, none of those things, because I want them to understand that giving is a part of worship. And anytime we come to worship, there's an expectation that you're going to give. There you go. That'll preach. <laughs> Uh, question about uh, the preaching. How do we maintain a balance between preaching the word and tickling their ear, their itching ears? Uh, quote from 2 Timothy 4 here. Uh, Has the time come when people won't tolerate the gospel? Um, some people don't want the truth, right? And so uh, our job is to be the truth teller. Our job is to be the prophetic voice. It is not our job to make sure they receive it. It is our job to make sure we declare what the Lord has said. Um, some people don't want the truth. Uh, some people don't want to be delivered. Some people don't want to be encouraged. I, I believe if we, if we put it where people can get it, and it is the truth, 
and it will be the truth when they come back for it, that they will, uh, they will receive it. We're living in a day and time uh, where God's word is relevant to every situation and every context. So the question we have to ask ourselves, am I, am I preaching to the truth that my people are living? If, if, if I can get up on Sunday and never say anything about social unrest or social injustice, if I can never say anything about racism, if I never say anything about the political climate, if I never say anything about the election, if I never say anything about people being poor, if I never address anything that is controversial, I'm not preaching the full gospel. The gospel is not just the, that is not just intended to make you feel good. The gospel also has to bring with it a level of convicting. And listen, nobody signs up to get a beaten. However, Discipline and correction is part of the gospel. And I think we have to make sure that we declare the fullness of the gospel and leave it to God to do the to, to do the convicted. And listen, when we look at the scriptures, the prophets didn't live long <laughs> because whenever they got up and spoke truth to power, somebody was out to get them. It, God is looking for prophetic voices. Amen. It has been said to me, do not be surprised if you become a martyr, if you've spoken up. Um, just know it's coming, uh, but know that you've spoken the gospel. Um, there was one clarification asked for. So are you serving communion during this period or are you waiting to return to the building? Oh, thanks. Good question. So for the first six months, we did not serve communion. I did. We, we went back to serving communion um, only because I felt a call from God to commune my people. So what, what we do is I consecrate the elements. And then on the first Saturday of every month, I meet my people at the church and serve um, them communion. I take to my sick and shut in and I hang it on their door communion. For me, I, uh, after wrestling and praying about it, I had moved to a place where I said, if, if they were sick and shut in, I would serve them. And so I make it available. Now, I don't send communion with other people. You can't come pick it up for your neighbors down the street. You can't pick it up for you. You have to come and receive the communion. And I, and I serve it um, on, on the first Saturday of the month. I, I dispense, I, I, I distribute to each of my members who come um, the communion elements. But for the first um, six months, what I did was a liturgy of emptiness. And I said to my people, you really want communion. Well, there are people who really want a house to live in who are homeless. There are people who really want to work who can't find a job. There are people who are sick, who want to be healed. So take these six months and sit in suffering, wanting something that you cannot have access to. And then after I felt like God had spoken, I made it available, but I was intentional and in not giving out communion because they wanted it because we live in a world where people want and they think their money and their education can just um, drive everything. And, and so I wanted my people to sit in suffering, know what it's like to want something that is available that you cannot have. And then we moved um, six months later, we moved into serving communion elements. If you came to pick them up. Nice. And there's a good example of, other rituals that you can do, right? Um, I know I've shared in the chapels here, anointing with oil and things that can be done in your home. Yeah. And, and actually this, um, this last week, uh, we did a pan Methodist service with all of the Methodist churches in, uh, in Dover. And uh, we had talked about communion, but the one thing we all had in common as Methodists was love feasts. So we did virtual love feasts. We took all six, all seven churches and we gathered and we shared and, and it was an equally as rewarding and, and fulfilling experience. So, but what I've learned is I can't let the, sh the congregation, the sheep tell me what they want. I have to hear from God. And, you know, we're, right now we're serving communion, but, but at any moment that can change based on where this community is regardless. And I've had, you know, other people and other, I won't call names, in the community um, say, well, if you, your pastor won't serve communion, you can come over to my church. And my response has been, if that's where God is sending you, then I want you to go with my blessing. This house will follow um, the leadership of God. And that's where I am. And it's, you know, it was a hard, a hard place to stop. And I said, well, I, you know, I wrestled with myself, well, what if they leave or what if they go? Well, 
uh, if they were meant to be with us, they will be with us. And if the Lord is calling you someplace else, that I want you to be obedient to the Lord and go. Mm. And uh, oh, so we had other other questions too about um, getting worship leaders off the screen, so it's not about the cantor, the choir, or the preacher, but centers on Jesus. So then, what do we put on the screen? Well, I, I think it's okay to have um, people on the screen, but I, I think it's important, for, for example, for us, because we're not in a building, the first few weeks, the first few months, I was doing everything myself. I was doing the preaching. I was doing reading of the scripture. I was doing everything. And then we decided if we were in the building, there would be some other interaction and engagement. So every week we call people and say, you're going to do the welcome and you're going to do the scripture. And you're... So it's not about me standing there doing everything, leading them. It is about, I do the preaching, I do the calls of worship, but you know, the senior citizen, sister, you know, sister Sally's going to do the scripture and, and, and little Billy's going to do the welcome. And so it becomes a communal experience instead of let me stand here for an hour and talk to you and command your attention. I, I think in digital worship, we have to be intentional about creating community and people seeing themselves. So every week I have a man in the worship experience. Every week I have a child in the worship experience. Every week I have a woman in the worship experience. Every week I have a senior citizen participate in the worship experience. Because, because they can't be together, they still need to see themselves as community. Um, and, and, and even with the singing, sometimes it's a soloist. Um, sometimes it's just words on the screen. But it, it's it's they every week they log on, they don't know what they're going to get because that's what would happen if they were in church on Sunday. They wouldn't know what they were going to get until they got there. So it's breaking up the monotony and making worship something that they look forward to doing. Oh, and I have some other questions, which we probably won't be able to get to, but would you be open to having people contact you? I know that you are an incredibly busy woman <laughs> of God, but absolutely. I'm grateful for the opportunity and iron sharpens iron. And so I'll take any information somebody can share with me and I'll share whatever information I have available. Wonderful, wonderful. And the PowerPoint, people were loving that. So would that be able to be maybe made available even in a PDF or something like that, that they could have? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. But the, the one question I wanted to ask was, how do we have members join who cannot stand in front of the congregation and take the vows? Ooh, and so um, we created uh, what we call virtual fellows. So there are people who have joined our congregation virtually um, and they have um, rights and privileges to engage, but we don't allow them uh, to vote. And what we anticipate doing is when we're able to get back in the building is to have um, a, a mass uh, right hand of fellowship kind of service. But for those who, who do not live in the area and will not physically join the church, uh, we they're members, but they're more like virtual members in the sense that they don't have the full rights. They won't be able to vote for officers. They won't be able to hold an office. But anything we do, we uh, want them to interact and engage in. Because as a Methodist, uh, it's about accountability, right? It's about the congregate. You want to join the congregation and the congregation receives you. And I don't want, I didn't want to water down all of our Methodist doctrine to be contemporary. I think there are some things you have to remain true to. And so we, we allow them uh, to engage um, and to be a part and to join the Bible studies and to join ministries, but we don't allow them to hold leadership positions because they cannot take the right hand of fellowship and make the vow to the congregation that needs to be made. And that's a good point. It's understanding our context, understanding our denominational standards, all these things. And we're reevaluating our denominational standards since we've been online, let's face it. So double checking with what is happening within the trends within your denomination and decisions that are being made, right? Um, thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I don't know about all of you, but I feel like both of our presenters so far have not only been informing us, but we've been experiencing preaching today. Amen. 